just feel like something good is about to happen. I just feel like something good is on its way. He has promised that he'd open all of heaven. And brother, it could happen any day. When God's people humble themselves and call on Jesus. announcement time. Uh, if you have your bulletin and you got a calendar, there's a lot of things going on this month. Uh, most important, Tuesday night's board meeting at 630. So board members, make sure you're here. Uh, Friday, is the, Friday and Saturday is the Illinois teen event at Roxana's church. So uh, if you're a teen, <laughs> check with pastor about that. Not whether you're a teen, but whether you're going to go. <laughs> so, okay, and then um, March 19th, our ONU uh, Nazarene ambassadors will be here, our students from Olivet, and then they will be having lunch with the teens afterwards, but they will be here for the morning service, so make sure you're here for that. And then make sure you read your bulletin, make sure you read your calendar, and you'll be all up to date. <laughs> Our call to worship this morning is Psalm 121. worship this morning is Psalm 121, the first two verses. We read these words, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. As we gather together, may we have our eyes lifted beyond this horizontal perspective, and may we look toward the mountain of God realize that all things come from him and uh, he is the one who makes what happens here on earth and he also very much contains and controls what ha happens on earth and the apostle paul says what we or jesus himself says and paul confirms it what we do and say here on earth determines what happens in the spiritual realm 
So, Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and we ask and pray that you would just direct our attention towards you. May we see beyond what is seen, and may we believe for what is unseen, because we really believe that our help does come from you, and that we really believe that you are working in our world, and what we need to see accomplished is your working so that we can truly be a people of belief. Bless our time together as only you can, and we'll give you all the praise. It's in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Let's sing together again. Blessed assurance. Take your Bibles this morning. We want to continue our study of the seven miraculous signs that are found in John's Gospel. Our focus will be verses 16 through 21 of that passage of Scripture. One thing that I would like to encourage you to understand is that uh, if we don't take the flow of the stories of Jesus, we will be greatly deceived. We will Today, we will have an example of how if you just read the story before us and not consider what takes place before and after it, we will fall into a deception to, of thinking that Christ's only concern is that we get to today's seashore safely. And what we're going to discover as we look at what Christ says following the miracle, that his concern goes much deeper than our just getting to the seashore, our destiny for today, he's going to talk to us about moving from a temporal destiny, a temporary purpose, and he's going to move us to an eternal purpose. And what we are going to discover is that uh, that is a hard teaching. And it is so difficult. In fact, when you come down to verses 60 through 66 of this chapter, 
you'll discover that many disciples, because it was a hard teaching, decided to go a different direction. It's a very humbling account. John chapter 6 is a very humbling passage. Uh, I'm amazed at how God has been timing what I have been teaching and sharing with you. Uh, The feeding of the 5,000 was done prior to our discipleship weekend. And now the week Sunday after that, I am going to once again share with you from the context of the feeding of the 5,000. And we will see, uh, hopefully we will see, that just not the miraculous sign of feeding 5,000, but what Jesus has to say about the bread of life is the depth of the passage. John chapter 6, verse number 16, it says, When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, where they got onto a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, don't be afraid. Then notice verse 21. Then they were willing. Then they were willing to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. We're going to stop there with our reading, but we're going to continue on when we look at it together. And you'll notice verse 22, it says, the next day, you come on down, look at verse 25, you'll find out that Jesus is going to make statements about what it is to accept him as the bread of life. I hope that you will open your heart with me today. I hope that you will join with me as I've been processing my spiritual walk And I've been looking at this passage, looking at John 6 for several weeks now, and I've begun to understand that Jesus does help and assist the disciples to reach the purpose and destiny of a safe journey for that day. But what he's really concerned about is that they not only, we not only enjoy the feeding of the bread that was distributed for a physical sustenance, his big concern is our perspective, our belief on his being the bread of life and our willingness to take him as the bread of life so that we can move way beyond the temporary purpose and experience the eternal purpose, the eternal destiny that he has for our lives. I trust that you will join me and that you'll be willing to not only open our ears, And that we would be willing to open our eyes, but most of all, we'd be willing to open our hearts. The message that Christ has to this first century group of people is very appropriate for where we are, for those of us who are Christians in 21st century America. May God richly bless both the reading and the teaching of his word. life is not a sprint, but a marathon, right? We're in it for the long haul. And so it's step by step. It's not running, but it's just every day living step by step by step. And, you know, I've often said that I'm, I'm not a show horse or a race horse. I'm just no workhorse. You know, the one you get out of the stall every morning, you harness them up. Of course, this is coming from my background. You know, my dad worked horses, and so it was very common for me to see horses being harnessed together and plowing or something like that. But you know, I think God honors the workhorse. You're not a show horse, you're not flashy, but just faithful and reliable and so um, I think if we can just learn to take each step and then the next day take another step pretty soon it'll be our turn and we'll be seeing the, the
the gates of glory and um, be able to hear those wonderful words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Let's sing step by step.
be opened unto you. Father, we thank you for this beautiful prayer course. We realize it's taken right from the Sermon on the Mount. It's the words reflect the very heartbeat as Jesus shares with his disciples what it means to be a follower of yours. And so we humbly process together and think together what we've just prayed. Lord, we pray that uh, we would be willing to ask and seek and knock. But we pray that you would also understand that the context, context of those words are that we are seeking first the kingdom of God. We realize, Lord, that uh, in the busyness and drivenness of our culture, that uh, we sometimes fall way short of seeking your kingdom. We pray that you would forgive us we pray that you would forgive us for being so wrapped up in our agendas and so wrapped up in our plans that uh, we don't even have a clue of what your agenda may be. We pray that you would forgive us for being angry when our agenda doesn't go as, as it should. We pray that you would forgive us for even putting a wall between you and ourselves because we don't think you're doing what you need to be doing. Lord, we're reminded of the question that often is asked in our culture today. Why would a loving God send anyone to be eternally separated from him? Lord, may we understand that every single person, every single one of us have been forgiven. Jesus Christ paid the price for every single person who's ever been born into this world. And our prayer is that we would understand that it's not that you desire to separate from us. May we understand and realize and pray that we would be forgiven for the fact that we've just ignored you. And we continue to ignore you. Lord, we, we really do need a fresh insight into what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We pray for the people who are part of our congregation and those who are in need of prayer for temporary, temporal issues. We know that they are very real, and we know that they are something that causes us to face <laughs> the discipling of our faith, the strengthening of our faith. And Lord, we pray that we would be not so focused on what we think you need to do to fix things, but Lord, may we begin to understand that you who began a good work in us, in us want, you'd want to take it to its completion. And so Lord, I pray that we would realize that maybe what you're trying to fix is us. Maybe what you're trying to do is take the blinders off of us. Maybe what you're trying to do is establish your kingdom in our homes, establish your kingdom through our church and establish your kingdom in Madison County. And Lord, we, we, just, we just really need a fresh vision of that. We really need to understand and dig more deeply into the teachings that are found in God's Word. So we pray for those who, who are facing challenges right now. Our prayer is that it would not cause them to move away from you, but they would draw closer to you because of their surrender to the process of your transforming them into a disciple. Lord, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity we have to get into your word. And our prayer is that uh, the promise that was given in the Old Testament and reclaimed in the New Testament, that as the truth of God is planted, as the truth is thrown upon the waters, that it will come back. It will come back. Blessed of you and richly multiplying kingdom people. Lord, as the seed is sown today, we pray that those who have hard hearts 
would allow you to t turn the soil over. For those who have the cares of the world that are like thistles, may you remind us and show us that there may need to be some weeds pulled. Lord, for those seeds that fall upon those, the rocky soil, give us the grace that we need. Please give us the grace that we need poured into our lives. We do thank you for the teachings of the, of the stories of Jesus. We thank you for these seven miraculous signs. And as we once again look at this fifth miraculous sign, Lord, we spent three hours in it last week, and now you wanted to spend another 30 minutes in it. You really must want to tell us something. So, Lord, may we be open. May we open our Bibles so that we can see with our eyes. May we open our ears so that we can hear the pastor's interpretation. And Lord, I do not claim to be perfect in any way. So if there's anything that is said that is not true, we pray that your spirit would intercept it. But Lord, I do also pray that we would have our hearts open and that we would be willing to take and eat the bread of life. May we be willing to take Jesus Christ himself into the very center of our lives. As we think of what Christ says when he says, take and eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, we realize that he is not teaching some ridiculous cannibalistic kind of religion. You are simply inviting us to move beyond a temporary purpose and to move into an eternal purpose for our lives. So may your grace be poured into us. And Lord, as we sing this chorus one more time, may we truly ask, may we truly seek, may we truly knock as we seek first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. said amen and amen I want to say one word and I want you to in your own mind and own heart think of the picture that comes into your mind your thinking it's the word power. I don't know about you, but uh, one of the things that comes into my thinking is, uh, uh, is military might. I'm reminded of when the different countries of the world would like to demonstrate the power of their country and the power of their leader. They'll have a special day and we'll see on the news how they have this great celebration and the crowds by the hundreds and the thousands are there and they drive down the main street there of the capital, all of their artillery and all of the weapons and they want the world to understand that we are a nation who has tremendous power. We have large, impressive military machinery. I think of more Specifically, not the military uh, equipment that a nation may have, but we think of even in our own nation how when uh, a leader of the country is going to give a press conference, uh, when he is going to or she is going to address an issue, we realize that they must have tremendous power because there are dozens of microphones in front of them. 
Some even have little recorders that they'll put in front because this is a powerful leader. This is a powerful person, and we want to know, we want to hear uh, what they are saying because they are very important. They are powerful, and their words are powerful. I'm reminded of pictures of athletes or athletic teams. Have you ever noticed in the team picture, no one's ever smiling? It's always this. Nazarene smile, well, that's a good beat. Or when they're introducing on Monday Night Football, you know, they'll, they'll shoot up the person, he'll introduce himself, that NFL football player, and he says, George, from the University of Iowa. And he says it with this scowl on his face, and, and he wants you to know that he is a powerful athlete and he has gone through a great deal of training, and he's well put together, and he's got this strength that's going to make him a very effective ball player the next three hours. It's interesting that when God discusses his power, he uses a very unusual picture. He uses the picture of a clay pot. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, we discover Paul's teaching concerning the power of God. In verse 5, he tells the congregation there in Corinth that we preach Jesus Christ. We don't have eloquent speech we don't demonstrate tremendous power. We don't get caught up on some tangent that would help us to prove more powerful in our insight and in our teaching than anyone else. The thing is, we preach Jesus Christ as Lord. And we preach the fact that we understand the glory of God and the glory of God is found in the face of Jesus Christ. And after making this statement of, we preach Christ, who is the very glory of God, verse 7, we have this treasure in jars of clay. <laughs> Some translate that, we are all a bunch of crack pots. <laughs> I like that translation. God demonstrates his treasure in vessels that are fragile and flawed. In fact, as you go on down through verses 8 and 9, Paul uses terms that we don't hear too much around the 21st century church. As he talks about having the glory of God and his treasure in a crack pot, he says, verse 8, we are hard-pressed on every side. The message says, we're surrounded and battered by troubles. He goes on to say, we are perplexed. Work message says, we're not sure what to do. Verse 9, he used a, very, uh, a word that's very uncomfortable to us. It causes us a lot of anxiety. It says, we are persecuted. Message says we are spiritually terrorized. There are things that are going around. We're in the, we carry this treasure of God. We carry it around in our crack pot. And as we carry it around in our very being, we realize that there's spiritual battles are going on all around us. And we, therefore, are spiritually terrorized. I mean, we can be very easily controlled by fear rather than faith. Then he says, verse 9, we are struck down. Once again, the message says, we're just thrown down. We carry the treasure of God himself. We treasure the very presence of Jesus Christ in this crack pot. And because of that, we, un we understand what it is to be hard-pressed on every side. We understand what it is to be, uh, uh, to, not, to be battered and surrounded by troubles. We know what it is to be perplexed. We're not sure what the next step should be. We are spiritually terrorized. We feel like we've been thrown down and even stepped on. And this description that 
Paul gives us in 2 Corinthians 4 can very well be taken and put into what is described for us in the scene of John chapter 6. First of all, we want to look at the foundation of the scene. The foundation of the scene is what we preached on two weeks ago. It's early in the day, and the disciples are a part of doing the impossible. The impossible is what? There is a crowd of 5,000 men, and the impossible situation is the, that crowd is hungry, and Jesus needs to feed them. And Jesus puts the disciples to the test. And he asked Philip, how can we get the money? Where can we find the money to feed this crowd? And he says, I, pff, it's just impossible. We don't have the money. Then we have the one who brings up and says, well, well here's one small boy's lunch. We've got five loaves and two small fishes, or is it two fishes and five loaves? I, I'm not sure. Which anyway, it's a small lunch. And he says, well, here's this, but... I wish he wouldn't have said, but, but that's just not quite enough. We don't have the money. We don't have the resources. The thing that we see there is Jesus wanted to say, but you have me. You can look to me. And if you look to me, you will see that this is not an impossible situation. And we read there how Jesus has everyone set together in groups, probably groups of 12 or groups in, in 12 groups. You take 20,000 divided by 12, you'll get the number. I can't do it fast enough in my brain. But he has them sit probably in 12 different groups. Why? Because there are 12 disciples, and the 12 disciples are actually going to participate in the miracle. Christ could have just said, abracadabra, amen, praise to be the Father, and everybody had a piece of fish or bread. But no, he doesn't do it that way. He uses the disciples, and the food is distributed. Everyone has enough so that they're satisfied. It's not just a snack. It's a meal that everyone is satisfied. And in verse 13, it tells us that Jesus instructs the disciples to pick up all the leftovers. And guess what? All 12 disciples have their own basket filled with fish and with bread. It's the foundation of the scene. Jesus miraculously feeds this crowd of 5,000 men, 15 to 20,000 people. That's the foundation. Then we get to verse 16 through 19, and we see the frustration of the disciples. Jesus puts the disciples on a boat. And uh, they head across the Sea of Galilee toward Capernaum. Uh, verse uh, 17 says it's getting dark, and Jesus had not yet joined the disciples. Verse 18 tells us why they are frustrated. They are frustrated not only because it's dark and Christ hasn't joined them, but we read in verse 18 that as they get out three or four miles, a strong wind is blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles with a basket full of bread between their legs. Don't miss that. They had the basket, their own individual basket, that reminded them of Christ's ability to do the impossible. They experience the words of Paul. They have a symbol of God's power in their, in their possession, and they face frustrating circumstances. First of all, they're perplexed. They're not sure what to do. Verse 14 and 15 tells us that after the people saw the sign Jews performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Verse 15, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. They are perplexed. Why does Christ separate the disciples from the crowd? And if you were here for our discipleship weekend, we spent a whole session talking about the fact that Jesus did not want his disciples to get confused by a half-truth. See, the half-truth is, Jesus wants to take care of my daily food. The full truth is, Jesus cares about the whole world. 
And he not only wants us to have our meal, he wants the whole world to be fed, not only physical bread, but he wants also all people to experience what it is to partake of the bread of life. They're perplexed. Why has Christ put us on this boat? And now that the sun has set, it's dark, what is going on? Then, of course, they're pressed on every side. They're surrounded and battered by troubles. What are the troubles? It's dark. Jesus isn't there. Verse 18, a strong wind was blowing, and the waters were rough. Jesus directs the disciples in the direction of Capernaum. And what's interesting, their route would have paralleled the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And what we read there is that they are there going parallel to the Sea of Galilee, and they're rowing across the northern tip of the lake. They never lost sight of the shore. That's the picture. They never lose sight of the shore, and they fully expected to meet Jesus somewhere on the way. They kept looking. He's going to appear sometime at the seashore, and we can row in, little row in and get him, and he'll join us. But it's dark. He hasn't shown up. And then if that weren't enough, verse 18 says... The strong wind causes big waves. They feel the pressure of facing an impossible set of circumstances. They tell us in this section of the country, the winds invariably blow from the north. They tell us that winds would come from the mountains of Lebanon, sweep down through the valley, move across the Sea of Galilee toward the south. In other words, this was a common occurrence. And the disciples, they're rowing toward Capernaum, but these strong winds push them further and further south. To use the terminology that Paul uses in 2 Corinthians, And as the message paraphrases it, these disciples are rowing toward Capernaum, but they're being pushed by the wind, surrounded and battered by rough waters, and they're losing sight of the shore. Not only that, they're struck down, they're thrown down. Verse 19 says they had rowed three or four miles. They're facing horrible circumstances. And as they battle the winds and the waves, hoping that somehow Jesus would come to them, they're exhausted. Mark chapter 6, verse 47 and 48 says, they not only were no longer able to see the seashore, but Mark tells us they were in the middle of the lake and it was the fourth watch of the night. That means it was three o'clock in the morning. They're in the middle of a storm and they can't see any hope. Not only that, they also are spiritually terrorized because it says Jesus approached the boat walking on the waters, water, and they were frightened. What we see here is even in the midst, or they are in the midst of this horrendous storm, and when the presence of Jesus finally does appear, they're frightened. They're not sure what to make of the situation. Mark goes on to say that they thought Jesus was a ghost. They they cried out because they were terrified. Paul's words can fit right into these words, the scene of John chapter 6. The foundation of the scene is Jesus feeds 
a crowd of 15 to 20,000 people with one small boy's lunch. And they carry between their legs as they're rowing the results of the leftovers. God not only takes care of the crowd, but he has provided for them. They have their take-home pack right there beside them or underneath their seats. But the unexpected of life comes, and they're terrified, they're perplexed, they're being struck down. They're just, it's just terrible. It's very frustrating. Then we move in verses 19 through 21, and we see the formation of faith. Verse 19, Jesus came to them. They saw Jesus approaching, walking on the water. And as we said last week, we can't overlook the fact that the circumstances that cause the disciples to feel hard-pressed, perplexed, terrorized, beaten down, storm-tossed waters. And Jesus comes to them walking on those storm-tossed waters. And what we're going to do when we apply this, this story again to our own lives here in a few minutes we are going to make note of how in the kingdom of God, interruptions are very important. And what we need to understand is that our perspective of what an interruption to life is will very likely determine how my faith is developing or if it's not developing. It very well determines if I'm going to move from the crowd issue, which means I'm curious about what Christ can do and give to me, and move to a disciple issue, which is the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord of my life, and he is going to continue to work in my life, and whenever something interrupts my life, my response to it determines what's happening in my life. Am I moving upward or am I backsliding? See, there's no plateau in the Christian faith. We are either climbing in holiness and Christ-likeness, or we're backsliding. Christianity is never linear. And you, can, you don't just stop at some point and then pick up where you want and keep moving. No, it is as we demonstrate it. If you don't have the notes, they're back there in the back. That final chart, it is an upward call. It is an upward journey. And because it is on this upward slope, we are either through the grace of God continuing to move upward or we are allowing gravity, anti-Christ attitudes and ways, to pull us down the slope. So Jesus comes to them and he is walking on the water. The very thing that's causing them to wonder what's going on is the way, is the street that Christ uses to come into their lives in a fresh new way. He comes to us. What a savior. He comes to us. And then he speaks. Again, verse 20 says, They were frightened, but he said to them, It is I, don't be afraid. In the original language, this is what it says. I am, no fear. I am, no fear. It's interesting. He doesn't say, hey, I was. He doesn't say, I will be. He says, right now in your life, you need to realize that I am. Therefore, no fear. Don't let fear control you. Don't let fear be that principle that guides your next step. Let faith be the controlling factor of your life. Because what? I am. And we may have a relationship that that was reflected in I was, That's a good start, but he's I am. 
And we understand and we realize we take great comfort that he will be. But before we can get to I will be, we have to come to terms with the fact that he is I am, I am, I am. Verse 21 is where we want to land then. Then they were willing to take him into the boat. John wants us to see that Jesus comes walking on the water, but he will not barge, barge onto the boat. He will always come to us. But we must understand that we must invite him. We must allow him to come into our boat. They were willing. They chose to take him in. That'll preach. That's what I'm doing. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, I just want a fresh vision of Jesus. I just know Jesus is, is alive and well. Well, here he comes. Let him in. Invite him on board. Then it says, when they were willing to take him into the boat, immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Whoa. Now that one brought a lot of questions into my mind. Let's don't overthink it. The moment they were willing to take Jesus into the boat, their destiny for that day reached fulfillment. Oh, I'm just going to invite Jesus into my boat so that each day I get safely to my destination. Uh, don't, we can't stop there. Because the passage continues. You know, you know, you, if you remember, I said when we introduced this series of sermons that one of the dangers we face is to take the miraculous sign and never read the teachings of Jesus immediately following the miraculous sign. And that is so important right here. We could stop and say, oh, it's fantastic. If I invite Jesus into my boat for this day, I'll get through the storm of that day. Well, that's, a fair, that's one interpretation, but that's not what Christ really wants to teach. Because it says, verse 22, the next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite side of the shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with the disciples, that they had gone away alone. Verse 24, the crowd realized that neither Jesus or his disciples were there, so they got into their boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. We got to keep going here. Verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they, the crowds, they asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, please, please note this. Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed. Those signs were to do what? To get these people to believe. To not only take him into their boats, but to take them into their lives. And he says, you didn't come because I wanted to believe, you wanted to believe in me. You came because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Oh my goodness. Do you see the depth of faith that Christ is talking about? The crowd say, hey, where were you? Where'd you go? Jesus says, you really don't want to, you really don't want to believe. You know what you want? another fish sandwich meal. And he goes on and says, verse 27, do not work, let's say, do not seek for food that spoils, but seek for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. 
Oh. You see, what we see here, please stay with me. This, this practical application for the next few minutes is so important. If you're like me, you've heard dozens of sermons on the Jesus walking on the water and he gets the disciples safely across the lake. But in his conversation, in his discourse that he offers after this miraculous sign is so important. And what we see is you look at it carefully. We're going to look at a few other verses. But as you look at it carefully, you begin to understand that Jesus wants people to understand that he, he not only wants us to be willing to take us into the boat, he wants, to take us, he wants us to take him into our lives. In other words, he wants us to not only experience temporal purpose, he wants to, us to experience an eternal purpose every day of our lives. It's, it's not just taking him into our boat, but taking him into our everyday life so that we understand the eternal purpose of our lives. And it's interesting how in the next several verses, beginning there on 26, 27, on down 28 and 29, Jesus de describes the contrast between the temporary purpose, a temporary destiny just to get through the day, and an eternal destiny, a purpose of becoming a kingdom person. We read there verse 26 and 27. Look at verse 28. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works that God requires? Jesus said, the work of God is this, to believe in the one who has sent me. I want you to believe. Well, I, I acknowledge that he's the son of God. That's the beginning step. We have to not only believe that he is the son of God, but we invite him into our daily lives. And we are in this conversation and in this relationship with the Heavenly Father because Jesus is the bread of life and the Holy Spirit is just, we're just constantly deepening our relationship with him. And we understand that if we don't get to the other side of the lake, his purpose can still be accomplished. And what's really interesting Christ says, you just want more food. I want you to take me. You want physical bread? I want to give you myself. In fact, it, he says, beginning there in verse 35 and down through verse number 51, verse 35, he says, I am the bread of life. Verse number 41, I am the bread of life. And you know what the crowd does there? They begin to grumble. Whoa. Has a pastor preacher been there? I wish this was the only group of people who claim to be disciples who, because of the hard teaching, decide to go another direction. It's been repeated over and over throughout church history. Verse 48, I am the bread of life. Verse 51, I am the bread of life. Notice verse 53, Verily, tr very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He's not teaching some cannibalistic ritual. He's talking about the very reality of Christ. Bring him into my very being. The picture there reminds me of what? The Lord's Supper. It's a symbolic act. Symbolic of what? I've been crucified with Christ. I take his pattern into my life. 
Whoever, verse 54, eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up in the last day. What I would like to say to you, to put it in terminology that may be an oversimplification, but it's what came to my mind as I processed this passage the past several weeks. What Christ wants us to do is to move from inviting him into our boats and accept his invitation to get on board his ship. I like that contrast because my boat's just a little puny boat, not room for a whole lot of people. I really like for him to be on on board with me as I cross those storm-tossed waters. But Christ says, would you just come out of your little tiny boat and come aboard my ship? I think it's a huge combination ocean liner, cruise ship, great military ship, got all kinds of weaponry on it. And I would like to share with you this truth. Just coming on board, (laughs) coming along from what we shared a week ago. Why would Christ invite us to be willing to not only take him into our boat, but to come onto his ship? Because he wants us to have a maturing faith. Philippians chapter 1, verse 4, 5, and 6. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy, confident of the fact that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. He wants us to mature. Why does he want us to come on board his great ship? Because God's plan is that we become more and more like Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 28 and 29, we know that in all things God works for the good. What's his good? That we be conformed into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. He invites us to come on board his ship so that we will cooperate with the Holy Spirit, who's never leading us forward in holiness. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, make every effort to live in peace with everyone. He's talking about relationships. And to be holy. For without holiness, no one will see the Lord. You can't get to heaven if you're not entirely sanctified. That is a wrong interpretation. Holiness, pick up the notes, look at the last chart. It's this ever upward call. It's this ever responding, God speaks, I respond. God speaks, I respond. And as as he speaks and I'm responding, you know what happens? The people around me begin to see Jesus. That's what that verse is really about. It's not our eternal destiny. It's the kingdom around us. Are people seeing Christ? Oh, then he goes on. Not only be holy, he says, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. Why? Because if you don't continue to grow, if you fall short, a bitter root may grow. It causes spiritual trouble and defilement. Cooperation with the Holy Spirit when we're on Jesus' ship. One final point of application. As I've been preparing, I couldn't help but notice that there is a perspective that permeates our current culture, both outside and inside the church. We can be so focused on our temporal life that anything that has to do with faith development is considered an interruption. We can be so focused on temporal life that anything that has to do with faith development is an interruption. I don't have time for that. 
I hope you realize that the reason we come together to worship, the reason that I work diligently to try and give an honest teaching of God's Word week after week, the reason we encourage small group involvement, the reason we have an hour of prayer, everything that we are doing or seeking to once again establish is for your faith development. And we can be so focused on the temporal life that anything that is, has to do with my faith development is an interruption. See, faith development gets its start as we go through our daily lives. It only takes root when we are in community, when we, are, are, when we allow ourselves to interact with others, we allow others to ask us how we're doing. It, it's more than just hearing a sermon. I once, did a, I once did a survey unofficially at a church where I was an interim pastor, and each week I asked him what I preached on the week before. It was very disheartening. Because they may have nibbled at the meal, but we fall, we just fail to really gain nourishment. And so we have to have it apply. And so we need we have to enter into this dynamic. We pray revival, revival. The Wesley revival was so successful because John Wesley said, Hey, if you're not in a small group, sorry. You know, we hear there's a lot of conversation about tithing. And one of the things that I've heard a lot of times, many times, I just don't want, I can, well, I, I, I don't tithe my money, but I do tithe my time. 168 hours in a week. If you would tithe, if we tithe our time, that's 17 hours a week. And what I'm going to start saying, they don't say it a whole lot anymore, because I guess I don't bang tithing over people's heads anymore. I just feel like if the Spirit wants you to give, and he does, he'll tell you. But I, next time if I ever hear that, I'll say, tell you what, if you will give 17 hours a week to your faith development, if you'll tithe your time, man, I'll celebrate with you, because your life will be transformed. If we say yes to the invitation to take Jesus into our life, to take Jesus into our agenda, to take Jesus into our schedules, we become so focused on the, the eternal aspect of life and anything that interferes with our faith development, that's an interruption. See the contrast? Satan called a worldwide convention. In his opening address to his demons, he said, you know, we can't keep Christians from going to church and we can't keep them from reading their Bibles and know the truth. We can't keep them from biblical values, but we can keep, do something else. We can keep them from forming an intimate, continual experience with Jesus Christ. If they gain a connection with Jesus Christ, our power over them is broken. So let them go to church, let them have their Christian lives, but steal their time so they can't gain that experience with Jesus Christ. This is what I want you to do. Distract them from gaining hold of their Savior and maintaining that vital connection throughout their day. Well, how will we do this? Asked the demons. Keep them busy. Keep them busy with the non-essentials of life. Invest unnumbered schemes to occupy their minds. Tempt them to spend, spend, spend. Then borrow, borrow, borrow. Convince them to work six or seven days a week, 10 or 12 hours a day so they can afford their lifestyle. Keep them from spending time with their children. As their families fragment, their homes will 
no, will offer no escape from the pressures of life. Overstimulate their minds so that they cannot hear that still small voice of God. Entice them to play the radio or CD when they drive. Keep the TV, the DVD player, and their CDs going constantly in their homes. Fill their coffee tables with magazines, newspapers. Pound their mind with the news 24 hours a day. Invade their driving moments with billboards. Flood their mailboxes and email with junk. Stuff like sweepstakes. Any kind of newsletter, any kind of promotion. Even in the the recreation. Let them be excessive. Have them return from their holidays exhausted, disquieted, unprepared for the coming weeks. And when they gather for spiritual fellowship, involve them in gossip and small talk so they leave without any soul fulfillment. Let them think they're involved in evangelism, but but crowd their lives with so many good causes that they have no time to seek power from Christ. Soon, they'll be working in their own strength, sacrificing their health, sacrificing their family unity for the good of a Christian cause. It was quite a convention. And the demons went eagerly to their assignments. Was the devil successful in his scheme? Let's you and I be the judge. I'm reminded of what Jesus says in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, quoting from Peterson's The Message. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. And please, he says, I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Lord, I just need a little more, a little more fish and bread. If you just get me through today. Jesus says, hey, I'm much deeper than your schedule for today. I want to bring an eternal purpose to every minute and every hour of your life. That comes when we let go and take Jesus Christ completely and fully into our life, our habits, our schedule. Jesus, we thank you for your honesty with the crowd. Peter calls Satan a roaring lion. And what is so concerning is even though he may be roaring, we have become so deaf to you because we've filled our minds and our hearts with the roars of the lion. Lord, we've gone from February into March And our prayer is that we would allow 
what you have been teaching us the past several months to truly permeate our minds and our hearts. I pray that we would have the courage to be consistent and constant in our response to you. I pray that you would forgive us for being so focused on the temporal life that we have bought into the world's idea that anything that has to do with faith development is an interruption. Just don't have time for that. Lord, please turn that bent toward temporal self. Turn that bent in me to an eternal, Christ-centered, other-centered way of seeing life. Lord, I really want my perception of what an interruption is to be changed. We thank you for the way that you've moved in the past. And our prayer is that we would very wholeheartedly jump into the teachings of you, Jesus Christ, and that we would learn not only from the teachings of Christ, but from the movements of God that have happened throughout the centuries of the church and even those that are happening right now in various spots in our nation. May we not be caught looking at the videos and wishing that something would happen like that around us. May we practice the disciplines so that we can come become disciples. Thank you for your teaching. Those people in John 6 were right. That's tough. But we're reminded that as the crowds went, there, went the other direction, Jesus looked at the 12 and said, are you also going to leave? And their response was, Jesus, why would we leave you? Because you have the words of life. You are the way. You are the truth. And so even though others may walk another direction, we're going to stay with you. Thank you for your promise, Lord, to not only begin a good work in us, but to take it to its completion. Thank you for the fact that uh, in all things you are working to make us more like your son, Jesus Christ. Forgive us for asking for comfort when you want to bring Christ-likeness to our lives. And Lord, thank you. Thank you for calling us to be a people who are holy. Not perfect, but in the relationships of our lives, there is a sweetness that's so inviting. Lord, please, may none of us miss the grace of God. Lord, we really don't want any bitter root to grow and defile us. Lord, we don't want to miss your amazing grace that began before we were even saved and is going to carry us onward throughout all eternity. Dismiss us from this place. But please, Lord, may we not allow the Holy Spirit to be, to be dismissed from our thinking and from our praying and from our seeking. Truly, we pray this benediction. With joy we pray, with, that, with a confidence, he who began a good work in us will take it to its completion. In the blessed name of Christ we pray. Amen and amen. God's richest blessings as we go our separate ways.